Yeah, uh, Ziggy Stardust, uh, Bob Dylan, James Carville, Hendrix, and now Steve Wise. Um, when the dots had connected, and you knew you'd be part of DA's and Chris's large uh, filmography and, 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 and characters that are, are very, you know, part of the fabric of doc film. Yes. Um, what was your impressions? Did you have reservations, or were you just ecstatic that that you can bring your issue onto a platform that comes from legendary filmmakers? What was your What was your first uh, gist of uh, emotional? I was, I was I was ecstatic. Uh, I, I first of all I knew that they would do an excellent job and that they would present us you know, fairly mm -hmm. and that uh, people would notice it and uh, we might have a chance of getting into in, into uh, a, a place like Sundance or even get nominated for, for an Oscar. Mm -hmm. And that, so, I, so I knew that the, the film technically would be done exceedingly well. And, uh, uh, and then I was greatly honored that they, that they chose to spend I, these, those, these next years, although I'm not sure if they realized it was going to take four years on the day that they committed to it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, that, that I was honored that they they uh, chose us for the next for, for the project for the next uh, X number of years, and then uh, on a personal level, I got to move into their kind of circle. I got to meet people they knew. I got to meet their very large family. You know, whenever I go to New York City, I always have lunch with them. Or I go up into their apartment. I listen to Penny Baker's. Um, you know, he must have two thousand seventy eight records. We sit in his living room and, 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 and he plays uh, records from the 20s, 30s, And he has 40s. about the same number of stories as well for he, all these film productions that he, he, he he's involved in, with. Indeed he does. It, doesn't, it seems to me like he knows everyone uh, you know, alive and dead in, in the uh, film industry <laughs> and probably uh, in the rock industry too, certainly, uh, certainly for, 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 the, for the 60s and 70s and, and 80s. Uh, I know one, one of the stories. It, it's funny, he, he doesn't... Um, he doesn't drop names. Uh -huh. He just kind of casually mentions people when they're required for a story that he's talking about, and uh, he clearly is not dropping any names. Yeah, he's it's just, it's just part that. of the story. So I, we were listening to a uh, record, um, Bessie Smith, and it, it may have been her. I, I'm not sure who it was in his uh, up in his living room, one, one of the 78s. I'm sitting in a chair, and and he looks at me and said, he said. You know, Janis Joplin sat right there, and I told her, "Listen to how she's singing. That's as the way I think you ought to sing." Wow! <laughs> You've devoted a significant portion of your life to the animal rights movement, and are part of a large group of uh, philosophers, academics, and legal persons, uh, people that are very important to uh, as agents of change. Um, when making a doc film, you want your protagonist to wear his colors and be be super bright. And, and if I'm comparing you to all their other doc subjects, you're perhaps the most um, humble and the most uh, grounded individual of of them all. And I'm thinking this this straight shooter attitude that we see on screen has a lot to do with with all the not the pluses but the minuses that are involved in in tackling such a heady impossible subject i was wondering do people in the is it is it a fair assessment to say that you have a tough skin and that and that even a small victory is 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 always going to be subdued and it's it's never you're always looking for something that's that's larger but will never occur like like how does that how does that affect you mm -hmm. as a person well you know we first of all you measure everything against your expectations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've been studying this and been preparing this for more than 30 years now. And it led me to become a student of, of human slavery, of uh, law that goes back as far as law goes three, three or 4,000 years ago. And so I've always been fully cognizant of how difficult the task is that, that we have. Mm -hmm. And how it's unlikely we're gonna win the whole shebang, but we, and what we're looking E easily or even early, mm -hmm. we look to try to win a piece here, a piece here, a piece here, a piece here, and then keep putting them together, and then keep trying to um, churn out or turn out, you know, the best possible you know, product that we can, the best affidavits we can, the best arguments we can, and uh, we we do feel good when the judges say from the bench, you, you, we don't agree with you, but boy, your memos, your affidavits are really super. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we know they are, and we know, we know that we're writing just not for us and just not for the court, we're writing for history. Mm -hmm. And we're also not interested in anything except winning. So everything we look at, when it comes down, good or bad, we say, okay, how, how do we 
how do we then build on that so we move on to our next case. Um, at right now we're probably, I guess we're in, in month you know, 26 since we started and we are far, far ahead of where we thought we would be in month 26 uh, when, when we started filing the suits in December of 2013. So that, that encourages us um, as well as the fact that the world is changing. You know, we, we are, I think in the, in the film at, at one point I say, when we weren't looking, we went into the mainstream. Uh -huh. and, and I think that's true. And we've always been pushing mainstream things, but I think many people still view us outside of the mainstream. I think we're, I think we're now moving to what we are directly in the mainstream, asking judges to do things that have never been done before. So uh, we think that the, the uh, we think that the, we're going to win faster actually than we thought we would. We don't know when that's going to be, but uh -huh. we, know, we know it's going to happen because we know that we're not only morally right, but we know that the values and principles that we are asking the judges to embrace are the ones they already claim they do embrace. And the only way that we can lose is if they begin to act in an arbitrary way. And arbitrariness in law is unstable. Mm -hmm. it, it, it might take us down for a month or a year or five years, but eventually it will fall because we will keep pushing at the arbitrariness. Of course. If it takes centuries to, to critically change the mind of the populace, and judges are a reflection of the changes in society, then um, is the larger, larger part of the problem the promotion of welfareism? No, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I think that, um, uh, that welfareism is really important because mm -hmm. you know, while we are, and eventually others will be joining us, trying to you know, break through the barrier, break through the wall that separates uh, things who lack the capacity for any rights and persons who, who have the capacity to be infinite, number of rights, while that's happening, billions and billions of animals are going to be suffering and are going to be killed, and somebody needs to come in and do what they can you know, for them mm -hmm. while we're trying to, to stop the whole thing. And uh, I, I, think we, I think we both have an, a, a very you know, powerful role to play. Mm -hmm. So we, we certainly uh, do not criticize them. In fact, we support them, that uh, we, we don't want all of these animals to suffer while we're trying to fight for their rights. Mm -hmm. So we, we and, and indeed we, we are all animal welfare lawyers ourselves. You know, as, as a lawyer practicing animal welfare lawyer for 30 years, that was the only, that's in my private practice, that was the only kind of law I could practice. You know, it wasn't until December 2nd, 2013 when I stood up in front of Judge Sice in the Tommy case and tried to not to cry mm -hmm. because when I was thinking, because, because I understood and I thought to myself, it's the first time, you know, in 32 years of wanting to be an animal rights lawyer that I actually am. Yes. I'm actually arguing in front of a court and making a really damn good argument that the chimpanzee, you know, the non-human animal plaintiff in, in, that we're litigating before him is, is a legal person mm -hmm. to have a legal right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what, um, and, and we, we also think that, that judges who are kind of in favor of animal welfare, who just have... Of, uh, that you know that feeling that that you need, they will be more likely to look favorable uh, upon us too. Uh, if if I may say, we don't believe that our arguments can persuade any judge who doesn't walk in the courtroom with an inclination to want to rule in our favor. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we understand how powerful beliefs are, how long these sorts of beliefs that kind of we are the god to animals you know, has been around uh, in our society and in in our law and. We know how hard it's going to be to change it, and, and what we're what we're doing is trying to uh, aim our arguments at judges who are open, or at least not hostile, to to the arguments we, we are making. Those who are hostile, we're never going to change their minds. Uh, it's just how they grew up. It's just mm -hmm. how they are. Um, and when you read about the history of, of the abolitionist movement, uh, and you look at the judicial decisions, you'll you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. you know, even the northern judges, and many of them were so hard to persuade because they had other kinds of influences on them that they felt were more important. But the ones who are, who are at least open to, to the arguments, or may even be uh, inclined to view us favorably because of the way they feel about non-human animals, uh, they are the ones who are the real targets of our, our arguments. Uh -huh. The legal history, say, around dogs is very different than the legal history around cows and very different than the legal history around uh, chimpanzees or elephants. And uh -huh. there are just certain obstacles to bring, bring a, a common law habeas corpus case on, on behalf of dogs that don't exist for chimpanzees. 
Uh, and, and, so it's uh, almost as if it's safer to go in a, in a, in a territory where there's, there's less of a history because... Yes. Okay. There's nothing. There, there are no statutes that we have to get over. I understand. Oh, you know, we're, we, and, and there's no statutes that we have to get try to get a judge to interpret in a, in a strange, in a strange way. That, and so that that's but that's why we stay clear of interpreting mm -hmm. statutes all altogether. Uh, when watching the, the the courtroom back and forths and ultimately, uh, we 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 spend a lot of time with you and and your group of people waiting for decisions. Um, it's almost like coming to a card game, knowing the rules of poker, and then they tell you at the last minute that you're going to play bridge or maybe even uh, go fish. Oh my! For, you know, we we talk to each other and analogize to to playing whack a mole. Yeah. That that uh, a judge rules in this way, and we we say, okay, we're going to meet those arguments. The next judge, okay, then she rules another way. We do that, and the next judge rules an entirely different way. I think we've brought seven, six, seven, eight suits. No judge has ever ruled the same way the other ones ever have. And so uh, we just have to kind of calmly sit back, try to figure out how, they, you know, how this came about, mm -hmm. and then try to kind of keep, keep closing off, keep closing off uh, escape doors oh. so they finally have to deal you know, straight on with this intensely moral issue. Um, in mounting a, a, a case of personhood, um, would it, it is it feasible that that maybe a better strategy would be to go in a country that's maybe more favorable towards forward thinking i'm not saying that the us isn't that but um in terms of the court system or or maybe in a country where there's less i mean lobbyists or far, the farming agriculture world is not as as present did you ever oh yes uh, i actually think we are in that country now okay i, I think uh as far as the animal welfare issues goes, we're way behind Europe. We're always at least a quarter century behind Europe. As far as animal rights issue goes, we're way ahead of Europe. Okay. Uh, I mean, like, I, I, I teach at the Autonomous University of Barcelona and uh, every, every summer. Okay. And people come from all over Europe to hear what we're doing in, in the United States. Um, I just came back uh, uh, speaking to the Lisbon Portugal Police Department, you know about what what we're doing. We're working with the Green Party in France. We're working with with really? legal organizations in England, in Australia, in Argentina. Okay. And uh, I still think that we are ahead of all of them, and uh, our, our arguments are, but but our arguments are, are crafted for common law English speaking countries. Mm -hmm. And so, when we go, especially go to a non English speaking civil law country, mm -hmm. you know, we don't say that we know what to do. We can say we can try to help you figure out what's the best way for you to proceed. It might be through the legislature, say in Argentina or Switzerland or France. Uh -huh. rather, but but we we have learned a lot, and uh, we we're with you to try to guide you if you think you need our guidance. And uh, people, so we, in fact, we even have an international coordinator who works in Chicago, Great. whose whose job is uh, once I go over to a country, make the personal connection, begin mm -hmm. speaking with people. Then I turn I turn them over to her and I come in every, every now and then. But she then begins to also establish a relationship with them. Awesome. And awesome. the whole there's many parts of the world where all kind of move, moving forward. There's a moment in the film where a judge reacts to the notion of actually it's I think it was your first court case, the the notion of the slave argument. Yes. Um, and I think it's the I mean I think it's the most logical deduction or leap that you can make uh, in your in your argument. Um, why do you think it's not a palpable point? Why do you think, why do you think, in a judge's point of view, why is it, why is it almost uh, sacrilege to mention both in the same conversation? I, I think it has to do with, with who the judges are. Notice none of them are black judges. None of them are judges of color. They're all white mm -hmm. judges. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but and we we are actually have reached out on the beginning to work with um, academics and and law professors of color mm -hmm. to try to, who are already writing in the intersection between, you know, our work and slavery. Um, we, we talk a lot about what that problem is and, and, and how to deal with it because there's really two issues. One, as I tried to explain to the judge before she keeps cutting me off, um, uh, it, is that in the Anglo-American system, you look to precedent. And so we're one of the few professions where where something that happened in the past is important just because it happened in the past. Mm -hmm. Whether it's right or wrong today, you still have to begin dealing with something that happened in, in, in the past. So every time a common law lawyer arguing under the common law is making an argument, we argue by analogy. 
whether that's the re someone like Judge Posner, for example, of the Seventh Circuit, is thinks that legal reasoning is really bogus. The whole thing is, but he's just in the Seventh Circuit. He's all by himself. And but mostly, judges, you know, common law judges, begin by looking at what's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. So, we are the first lawyers trying to to apply the common law to non-human animals. We have to analogize the past. The, the, the past includes 100% human beings. Mm -hmm. So we have to analogize to cases involving human beings, but we have no one to analog. We have nothing to analogize to uh, at, at all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, plus, as I point out in, in the movie, the Somerset case, where James Somerset was a slave uh, who, who uh, you know, won a lawsuit in 1772 in London. In fact, I wrote an entire book about it called "Though the Heavens May Fall," mm -hmm. which was really a um, uh, a blueprint for what we intended to do. And as I point out in court, in 1775, New York State, when it, when it let it sever ties with England, brought the common law of England into its own law. So the Somerset case is actually also the law of the state of New York. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we make those kinds of analogies because they're, they're very, very powerful. They, they involve the uses of the common law writ of habeas corpus. And uh, I, I think it's it's erroneous for the judges to to somehow think that uh, that it's off limits. Who are we supposed to analogize to? Uh, also, uh, it's you know it, it's clear that we're not making we're, we're, and as we try to say we're not saying that non-human animals are like black people. Uh -huh. it, it's ridiculous. Uh -huh. the, so far, the only people who have made that comparison are these kind of these two judges, the National Review and the New York Post. You know, neither of which are major, you know, civil rights kinds of <laughs> people. They see it as a way of bludgeoning us because, uh, uh, because they really they don't want rights for non-humans. They're not particularly interested in rights for lot, lots of humans either. Uh -huh. And so we just kind of push forward. And within our organization, we we have a debate as to how to handle that, and we haven't yet completely agreed. You know, but what I tend to say is. Or, or think is when judges say that, you know, I want to try to very politely <laughs> continue to press the point because the non human animals are things, they are slaves. Whether you like it or not, they are slaves. And so I think part of the problem could be that, that these judges feel that if they if they are forced to believe that the non-human animals we are representing are slaves, then they're going to be forced to rule in our in our favor. Mm -hmm. So they'd much rather not think of them as slaves, think of them as some kind of other that allows them to make some kind of this arbitrary distinction, yeah. and it makes them happier. But I think our job is to, is to is to really set off the cognitive dissonance that, that that's kind of inherent in that kind of thinking. They are slaves. Now you may say. Okay, these kinds of slaves we're gonna we're gonna unenslave, and these kinds of slaves we're gonna let rot for the rest of their lives. Well, then be intellectually honest to come out and say that, so we all know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, don't just say I don't I don't want to hear this. Um, your job is to really hear it. Yes. And uh, and we're, we're having we're supposed to be having a rational argument here, and not when we say something that that offends you. You're, then you're supposed to, you're not supposed to shut us off because you feel offended. That philosophical spectrum. Peter Zinger's Animal Liberation. Yes. Um, first of all, he's an in, a huge influential figure and he's still being referenced uh, part of a larger, di this larger discourse for animal rights and ethics. Yes. And, but 40 years later, how do you view his text, its relevance, and do you find it's outdated or, or dated? <laughs> um, in, in, in your argument, You're, do, do, you, do you see it as, as, a, as something that worked for that time and today it's... it's no, I still think it works for today. Okay. I, I think it, it works for the audience it was intended for, which is, which is to introduce people to the idea you know, of utilitarian arguments mm -hmm. you know, for the protection of animals. It's not an animal rights book. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, the arguments about biomedical research or you know, his examples and the examples of, of factory farming, uh, alas, they are as valid or more valid today than they were in 19 whatever 68 or mm -hmm. 70 when, I think it's the 70s yeah whenever when, whenever he he did it mm -hmm. so I think it's a great introduction and I I use I ask people to read it all the time I don't think it was ever intended to be a legal legal argument mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we don't make utilitarian legal arguments because judges the reason we don't make them is that we only make the arguments that 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 
implicate the values that judges themselves claim they hold. Mm -hmm. They do not claim to hold these kinds of utilitarian values. Of course. They claim to hold deontological values that when we talk about fundamental rights, no one talks about balancing pains and pleasures. You know, I have a certain right not to be tortured, you know, no matter what the consequences mm -hmm. are, you can't torture me. And mm -hmm. if you do, you're violating domestic law and international law. Uh, it's not a matter of saying, if I torture you, you'll feel really, really bad, but a lot of other good things will happen. That's not the kind of arguments of that course. judges will buy. Now, utilitarian philosophers think that that's what's morally right. And, you know, we always have to remind each other that what's morally right and what's legally right may or may not have anything to do with each other. To make this off the street, it is almost turned down, but um, there, this is the poster art for... Um Unlocking yes. the Cage. Um, HBO is releasing it, yes. um, what a I great believe, this summer. Poster. Oh my God. It's a great poster, but my question is, um, is uh, it's almost science fiction because as much as I would love to see this... The ape city, the chimpanzee city. Exactly. Yes. Do, do you ever think in your lifetime, or perhaps in my lifetime, a little <laughs> bit younger than you, that we'll ever see a Tommy... In, in a court system? No, no, I, we, we wouldn't. Uh, we, we would never consider bringing a chimpanzee in, 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 into a court. The same reason why we wouldn't consider bringing children in. Mm -hmm. um, court, courtrooms are really tense, unhappy places <laughs> where people, you know, by definition, are engaged in an adversarial process and mm -hmm. are like going after each other, hammer and tong, and the judge is like jumping in, you know, saying, what about this, what about this? It's very, very tense situation. And so, you know, I wouldn't, being sensitive beings into it of any of any species, mm -hmm. especially someone who doesn't understand anything about what what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I've probably saved you know, more than a hundred lives of maybe a hundred dogs who were ordered executed in the state terminated, of Terminated. Yeah. You know, I came in, I got their death sentences reversed. I would never have brought <clears throat> any of my dogs into the courtroom. <clears throat> who knows what they're going to do? Yeah, they're yeah, dogs. Yeah. You know, and they're chimpanzees. Yeah. And so. I would, we would consider, and I have asked for a judge to take a view, which is to, look, you go to them mm -hmm. and look at whatever you want want to do. So far, I don't think any judge has ever taken me up on taking a view. Um, sometimes we think of um, you know, having chimpanzees, for example, show how they can communicate, that, that sort of thing. But I, I think that, and, and we're about to get much deeper into that, but I think we'll, we will start going with videos first and, and try to get really professionally done videos that we can attach to affidavits okay. uh, that will, will show that to the judges. But um, uh, I don't, you know, the chimpanzees are very strong yeah, no. and, uh, and they don't understand what's going on. I remember when I, I was um, tracking chimpanzees up in the Jabali Mountains in Uganda okay. and um, we were sitting there you know, on, on a path, and a, and a band of chimpanzees like walk in front of us, like they're you know they're a foot and a half away. And the anthropo anthropologist who who's with us says, you "No, know, look humble, put your eyes down." And I said, "I don't need to look humble. You know, I know he can like rip my rip my oh, arm off." Yeah. And so I did. I really I thought I was in their world, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't do anything that upset them. Uh, and, and so I, I can imagine what it must be like for them to come into in, into our world. And they don't have other chimpanzees explaining to them what, what's going on. <laughs> so I can't think of anything that would make it worth bringing a chimpanzee mm -hmm. in, into mm -hmm. court. So I have to assume that the poster is more metaphorical. Uh, it definitely is. But it's it's if if you if, if you you may know that uh, in April of 2014, uh, you know our work was the, was the cover of the Sunday New York Times magazine. Yeah. Uh, with a poster with with a cover that was actually reminds you of this with. I believe the chimpanzees on the witness stand uh -huh. you know, there. So I'm assuming that's metaphorical, you know, as well. Yeah.